When it comes to leadership, we sometimes get stuck in this mindset that there is just one path. There's only one way to lead properly. And, you know, there, there are good leaders and there are bad leaders and that's it. And we tend to simplify things a great deal when, in fact, leadership is really complex and, and there are a variety of ways to get to sort of the same place, right? There are lots of different paths that we can take to get to the same place place and people just tend to do it differently. But uh, over time that has uh, evolved really and, and the way that we see leadership has evolved. So I want to take a moment to look at some of the historical approaches to leadership and how we've come to this sort of study of leadership, where how that's evolved and, and the stages that it's gone through and, and how those approaches have changed. So um, I want to start with, uh, you know, initially when we talked about leadership, everything was about the trait approach, right? Great leaders are born. You're either born a great leader or you're not, or you're not. You either have those qualities or you don't, right? So the trade approach basically said, you know, they're, they're great leaders are born with these things or they're not. Uh, and so as a result, you end up with this uh, list of traits, essentially. These are some of the different leadership traits that that the historical approach would have said, this is, you know, if you're a leader, then you're born with these things. You're born with drive, a high level of effort and desire for achievement and ambition, or you're, and you have leadership motivation, this intense desire to lead others um, that, that exists within you. You have uh, you know, honesty and, and integrity. You have self-confidence, this sort of assurance in yourself and, and all these other things, right? That you have charisma and creativity and originality and and you know they would have said sex and gender is an important thing but they would have said you know, predominantly men are leaders women are not we're just born men are born leaders and women are not so these leadership traits um, are either born into you or they're not so again you're either born a leader or you're not so obviously we've moved beyond that a little bit we understand that that leadership isn't just something that's born into you certainly some of these things if you are born with somebody who's just really extroverted and has great charisma, then that will certainly make leadership maybe a little bit easier for you in that regard. You'll have that component built in, but that's not the only thing. And these aren't the only things that create a good leader. And it's certainly not something that you're either born with or not in a general sense. So we moved past that uh, historically and moved into uh, what people call the behavioral approach, behavioral approach. In, in other words, leaders are what leaders do. So if you behave like a leader, then you are a leader. And if you are a leader, then you should behave like a leader, right? That there's all these behaviors that are associated with it. So the behavioral approach, as as with many, many other good things in life, started with this Michigan versus Ohio State rivalry, right? And so really, in not in a sports sense, but in an academic sense, there were kind of competing people, uh, researchers at the universities of Michigan and at Ohio, at University of Michigan and uh, Ohio State University that were looking at leadership in terms of behavior and, and came up with different approaches in that regard. Really, though, the, the people who sort of pioneered this approach were Robert Blake and Jane Mooton. There you see them. And in 1964, they published um, some work that really uh, lent itself to the behavioral approach. And they developed what uh, became known as the leadership grid, the leadership grid. So uh, let's take a moment to look at the leadership grid. There are basically two axes on this grid, right? Two, two axes. One has to do with a concern for production. So the leader has to be concerned with, are things getting done? you know, basically task orientation. And there also though, has to be a concern for people, this relational orientation. So uh, we have these two axes, they create this thing. So concern for production and concern for people, obviously each of these could be either low or high. Uh, you could fall low or high on that scale. And so that creates this sort of four squares. If we, if we were to draw a line, you know, in the, in the midst there and, and create this axis, there's sort of four squares that are created. Okay. Uh, so um, you have different areas then. So one would be, for example, what what Blake and Newton called indifferent, where leaders evade and elude. So that demonstrates, though, a low concern for production and a low concern for people. Uh, not very effective as a leader in that regard, but if they're, if they're indifferent. Uh, you also have leaders that are controlling. Uh, their behaviors lend them to a controlling behavior where they're high concern for production and low concern for people. So that leads them to, to direct and dominate the people that are working under them. 
Then on the flip side of that, you have accommodating people who are constantly yielding and complying. That shows a high degree of concern for people and a low degree of concern for production, uh, Blake and Newton would say. Then finally, you have uh, what they call the sound leader, which is where they contribute and they commit a high degree of concern for both people and production. And then in the middle, they added a fifth little uh, area there, right in the middle, that had to do with status quo. Where you're balancing and compromising, you're using a little bit of each of these behaviors to try and just keep things moving forward, uh, not really growing, but not not diminishing either. Um, so status quo is balance and compromise. Then. Okay. Um, in contemporary terms, they've some people have come up with different terms uh, for these instead of the ones that Blake Newton came up with. You have the impoverished leader, the authority and obedience leader, the country club leader. Uh, the team leader, and then in the middle, you have the middle of the road leader. So just some, again, contemporary terms applied to this leadership grid. You'll see this around. I think there's, you know, there's certainly something to be said for the fact that leaders can demonstrate a certain, um, certain behaviors and, and, uh, but maybe not the end of the, uh, the, uh, the only way to go, but uh, one certainly valid um, consideration for leadership. Uh, another is what we call the situational approach. And that's really where you just say, well, it kind of depends. What, what is required of a leader? It depends. It depends what makes an effective leader. It just depends. Um, so uh, this was really pioneered by uh, Paul Hersey and Clint Ken Blanchard and 2001 published some work on this, on the situational approach, really, um, uh, codifying it and, and really uh, bringing it to, to uh, some sort of you know, public recognition in that, in that publication there. Um, and they essentially had kind of the same idea as Blake and Newton in the sense that they're a relationship. They said they're a relationship and they're task behaviors and they laid it out on a grid. So you have relationship and task behaviors that can range from low to high on either, either one of those axes. Uh, and then again, like Blake Mooton, you have like the leadership grid, you have this kind of um, grid that's created, this, this area that's created there. Right? Um, they then said that that really creates four leadership styles. Uh, and those styles uh, are, are laid out in this grid. Then you have the telling style, which as you can see is high and uh, and task, high concern for task behavior and low in relational behavior. The selling, which is high in both areas, the um, participating, which is high in, in relationship and low in task and then delegating, which is low in task and low in relationship. So, um, so there are these four different styles of leadership that are created then uh, based on this grid. Now, uh, Hersey and Blanchard went a little further though, saying that you must match that style to the readiness. Uh, a leader is going to be able to, an effective leader is going to be able to identify what that group needs and what they're ready for uh, because groups and teams go through these different phases. So what is it that this team is ready for them be able to apply the appropriate style. So if a, if a, um, if a group is in that kind of S4 block, S4 position, the bottom left, then they need a delegating leader, right? They need somebody who's really going to be on top of them and a taskmaster really. And, and uh, somebody who's going to hand out uh, items. If they're in that S3 box, then they would need a participative leader uh, and so forth. So they would say that, uh, or they're saying that a situational leader will be able to identify what the needs of that group are and then uh, apply the appropriate leadership behavior or style of leadership to that. Okay. The effectiveness of this is influenced by outside forces. Of course, you don't always, you're not always able to control um, what outside influences there are in the group um, and what kind of power you have and what structure there is and so forth. So um, that is one kind of drawback or, or thing to note about situational perspective is that it is something that is influenced heavily by outside forces. Then. Sort of the next phase that, that people looked at in leadership is called transformational approach to leadership. Really where a leader comes in and says, let's shake things up. There's lots of change ahead. We're going to, we're going to do things differently. We're going to just, you know, start over, wipe the slate clean and do things completely differently. And, and uh, so transformational approach kind of takes that mindset. In, in transformational approach, um, you, you have a leader that comes in, they instill a vision. Right. They lay out a very clear vision. This, this leader lays out a very clear vision and, and sets it in front of the employees. Um, then they demonstrate a passion for that vision. They really demonstrate that they are, they're rolling up their sleeves. They're getting in behind this vision. They're really doing the work as well. They commit to that mission. Uh, that leader commits themselves and that organization to that mission. 
right? and, and leaves no doubt that that's where they're heading. Uh, now, success, though, in this situation can be tied to the individual, though. Transformational leadership tends to, uh, in some ways, be reliant on that leader. Uh, so, for example, one, one example of a transformational leader uh, was uh, Jack Welch, who is the CEO of General Electric, Electric from 1981 to 2001 had been with General Electric for a long time, had been kind of frustrated with the fact that they weren't very innovative and that they, they didn't allow things to, to change and weren't very employee uh, friendly, employee centered, I guess. So when he took over in 1981, he flattened the corporate hierarchy, got rid of a bunch of different levels of, of uh, bureaucracy and things and flattened that corporate hierarchy. He lessened the formality of the workplace, allowed people to dress a little more casually and behave a little more casually. Uh, he embedded a succession plan um, and, and worked really hard on employee development and made that a part of the GE ethos, right? Uh, but he was also, he was very aggressive in demanding performance. In fact, he was famous for saying uh, constantly, he's telling his managers, fix it, close it, or sell it. So either fix it and get it right and make it, make it profitable, make it productive, close it, meaning scrap the whole thing, close everything down or sell it. If we can find somebody else who wants to buy it to sell. It. But if you can't make it work, then we're going to get rid of it one way or the other. And he was very aggressive in that and had, you know, some really kind of aggressive management styles in a sense, right? Rewarding the top portion, portion, firing regularly, firing annually, like 10% of the people who, who were in the bottom performers, even if they were performing well, if they were in the bottom 10%, then they got fired. But, and so all of this was effective. He, he really boosted GE's productivity and, and profits and through the changes that he made, and had this very clear vision and set the organization to that. They were very focused on that for a long time. He retired in 2001 and GE, his, his handpicked successor had not nearly as much success, uh, really, really uh, bottomed out for GM or GE, sorry. And, uh, and uh, because in, in many ways, all of this was really tied to the personality and the person of Jack Welsh. People bought into him as a leader. They bought into his policies. They bought into everything because they could see that commitment, that drive that he had uh, and knew that he was focused on that, that that was going to be the way it was. Once you remove his personality from the equation, it started to fall apart a little bit. So transformational leadership <clears throat> can be um, tied to or connected to specifically a one person kind of become a, a cult of personality, so to speak. So that's something to be aware of and cautious of as well when you're uh, thinking um, about different types of uh, leadership. One other kind of more specific subset of, of transformational leadership is what we call visionary leadership or the visionary approach to leadership, uh, which is something that's been uh, studied and considered over the years as well. Visionary approach is really fueled by the leader's dreams of what could be. So again, setting a vision out there, but really uh, imaginative, innovative on what could be. Uh, one of the, the best examples and most uh, notable examples of this would be Steve Jobs with Apple. Right. Um, of course, Steve Jobs was was a partner with Steve Wozniak in starting a and uh, starting Apple, and uh, but really it was it was Jobs's vision that that fueled Apple's growth. Uh, Woz was the the tech guy. He he knew computers, uh, certainly much more knew the technology much more than than Steve Jobs. But Jobs had that vision of what could be and where they could go. Um, for example, when they were developing the, the Mac, you know, the story of he came in and said to his designers, this is what I want this computer to be. I want it to be a, a singular shell, not able to be open. And I want it to be this shape and this kind of thing. And, and his people all said, that's not, you know, that's not how the technology works. It's not going to fit into something like that. Can't be shaped like that and so forth. And but his vision was so strong. He just said, that's what we're going to do. That's where we're headed. And by God, they made it work. You know, it was really hard on his people in that way to, to come up with, you know, make the impossible possible. Um, but his vision of what could be led to Apple's growth, uh, not once, but twice, because he left the company and then came back. And uh, when, they, when they started to falter and, and did it again with the development of the iPhone. And I mean, you know, iPhones are and, and smartphones are so common now that you don't even realize that it wasn't that long ago when that was just not possible. There was no consideration. I mean, your phone was just something you talked into. And we were just amazed when texting came around, let alone, what do you mean, put music on it and take pictures now that are, are you know, movie quality pictures? I mean, that's all because of the vision that Steve Jobs had in the sense that you know, other people were saying, never would have imagined that, but he had this vision of what could be.
um, which is great. Again, though, can be very much tied to that person, as we found when when he initially was was ousted from Apple, uh, and then they started to falter because they didn't have that vision that that fueled Apple's growth. Right? But uh, when he came back, they found it again, and now that he's gone, they kind of you know struggled some, but. Uh, they're, they're trying to figure it out. But these types of uh, leadership approaches can be very much tied to that individual then. So again, when we think about leadership, you know, it's not just one path. And we've studied that throughout history. We've studied leadership from all kinds of different angles. And people want to try and pigeonhole it into, you know, well, it's got to be trait-based or it's got to be situational. And that's, that's the only way to look at leadership. But again, the truth is there are many paths to leadership as we've discovered over the years. All of them worth studying. Not all of them really as valid as others necessarily. That's not my point. But, but all of them have something to offer, and all of them have led to our understanding of leadership in a contemporary sense. If you have questions about communication and leadership or anything related to that, please feel free to email me. I'd be happy to chat with you in that way and uh, and discuss this further. In the meantime, I hope you will uh, continue to study where we've been with leadership and how that informs where we're at now and where we could be with our understanding of what it means to be a leader.